Well, this morning I'm going to talk to you about muscle invasive bladder cancer. And remember, I, I told you when I had, that, had a break in the action last Wednesday when the, when the system went down, I had, a, I had a feral cat named Chomper. So I just wanted to show you that Chomper does exist. This is my disclosure. This is Chomper. You can see I'm feeding him right there. And this is a normal sized cat about five, five feet away. So he really is enormous. He's got about a body size of a, of a bobcat. Anyway, Chomper does exist. So let's get down to, the, down to the, the story here. So we know that there's level one evidence that supports the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy for patients with muscle invasive disease. But despite the survival advantage, you know, this approach is real underutilized. Why, why might that be? Well, for instance, meta-analysis reveals only a modest 6% improvement in five-year survival of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And today, we really can't predict prior to, to treatment who's likely to respond. And only those that respond dramatically, that is the 30 to 40 percent who rendered PT0, actually benefit from chemotherapy. And that's shown nicely by the results from SWOG 8710. You can see this is a trial comparing neoadjuvant chemotherapy plus MVAC versus cystectomy alone for patients with clinical T2 to T4 disease. And, and the PT0 rate was 35 percent, and those patients had a five year survival of 85 percent compared to about, about a 45 percent survival for those patients who received neoadjuvant chemotherapy without the same salutary response, or those patients who were randomized to cystectomy. We also know, though, that patients with organ-confined muscle invasive disease, who make up about 50% of patients in contemporary series, have an excellent survival with cystectomy alone. We'd expect a disease-specific survival of about 80% for these patients. But as you know, our current staging is, is grossly inadequate, and more than 50% of these patients are understaged and potentially undertreated. But adjuvant chemotherapy can uh, salvage some of those understaged patients. So how can we improve the impact of neoadjuvant chemotherapy? And this is, this is from a surgeon's perspective. I think we need to refine clinical staging to identify high-risk individuals likely to progress despite radical cystectomy alone. I mean, that's going to minimize morbidity and cost by eliminating the chemotherapy for those patients that just don't need it. And I think hand-in-hand, hand, we need to identify likely responders to platinum-based chemotherapy and also immunotherapy. I mean, this is going to improve response rates for those patients selected for therapy, and it's going to drive the development of new treatments for those patients unlikely to respond. And I think both of these approaches, hand-in-hand, hand, will improve the outcomes for our patients. So at MD Anderson, we've adopted a risk-based approach to select high-risk individuals for radical cystectomy uh, and low-risk patients for cystectomy alone. I'm sorry, for ne for, uh, high risk for uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and low risk for cystectomy alone. Our low risk criteria include clinically organ confined disease, a conventional histology, no LVI, no hydronephrosis. We'd, attend, we'd, you know, we'd expect to cure about 80% with cystectomy alone. The high risk patients are those who have a clinical 3, greater than equal to clinical 3T disease, either a mass or stromal invasion of adjacent viscera, a variant histology, LVI, or hydronephrosis. The cure with cystectomy is much less. Now, we get a lot of pushback, especially from medical oncologists who point to the, the level one evidence supporting neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So I asked whether we could justify this distinction between low risk and high risk. And the hypothesis was we could defend a low risk population with a disease specific survival comparable to that of patients with organ confined disease undergoing radical cystectomy alone. And we could salvage the understage patients with adjuvant chemotherapy. So we identified patients with uh, both low-risk and high-risk criteria who underwent radical cystectomy alone in a 10-year period at MD Anderson. We didn't with withhold chemotherapy from those patients. In the same time period, we had over 40% of our patients received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. We looked at a number of survival metrics, and we focused on disease-specific survival because it felt it over overcame some of the um, limitations and biases of overall survival. And we confirmed the results in a, in a, in a similar data set from a USC. So here's the data, as you'd expect, the survival of low-risk patients was superior to that of high-risk patients and was uh, similar to that of patients with organ confined disease at cystectomy. And this is the data from USC. The curves are virtually superimposable. However, upon final pathology, we find room for improvement. For instance, 27% of the patients we thought were high-risk were actually downstaged and found to have organ confined disease with no high-risk features at cystectomy. And they had a disease-specific survival comparable to those patients with, who were low-risk and remained low-risk pathologically, but a 90% to five-year disease-specific survival. We also understate 50% of our low-risk patients. They either had extra vesicle disease or, or high-risk features at the time of cystectomy, and they had an intermediate survival of about 75%. And these are the patients who were, who were high-risk and remained high-risk at, at cystectomy, about a 50% disease-specific survival at, at five years.
Now, we were able to, to salvage some of those patients with adjuvant chemotherapy. Here's the survival curve for those patients, and it's superior to those patients that receive no adjuvant chemotherapy. And the survival here for these patients is equivalent to that of patients with organ and mind disease that suspect me with, uh, alone. So we were able to identify a low-risk group of patients with a disease-specific survival consistent with that of patients with organ and mind disease. We could salvage patients with adjuvant chemotherapy, and we were able to confirm our classifier in two independent data sets. I didn't show you the second. It was a, a study done in Europe. But the fact was, we really did understage 50% of our patients. So we looked, looked back and we asked ourselves, can we take advantage of tumor biology to improve our treatments? I mean, are there biological tools that can stage patients and identify lethal tumors? And can these same tools you know, predict response to new adjuvant chemotherapy? So right around the same time, there were, some, there were some tremendous transforming breakthroughs in bladder cancer genomics. For instance, the TCGA effort and private efforts like, such as our own deeply characterized the major uh, genetic and epigenetic uh, features of muscle invasive disease. And this actually radically transformed our views of tumor biology and created new hypotheses for therapy. And I think for the first time, offered us the opportunity to really understand chemoresistance and to develop therapies for those patients that were chemoresistant. Now these are four, four papers released around the same time in which the authors use gene expression profiling to identify unique molecular subtypes and distinct, with distinct biology and natural history. And this is a paper from MD Anderson. And if you look at the different classifiers, these tumors can be broken down broadly um, based, on their, based on their natural history to basal and luminal tumors. Now this is the MD Anderson classifier. We had three subtypes. Uh, these are molecular subtypes based on gene expression profiling. A, a basal subtype, what we call it a P53-like subtype, and a luminal subtype. We found that the survival of patients who had basal tumors was inferior when they were treated by cystectomy alone to those with luminal or P53-like tumors. And we also observed that those with P53-like characteristics were resistant to cisplatinum-based chemotherapy. So this is uh, patients who were downstaged are shown in blue and non-responders in, in red. And you can see in our, in our uh, discovery subset, no patients who had P53-like tumors responded, confirmed that in a validation subset. And this is an external validation from Fox Chase. Now, in a, in a subsequent study, we looked at the outcomes of patients, the so high-risk patients who received neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to cystectomy. Our, down, our downstage to PT0 was 38%. Overall, there was a 63% five-year overall survival, which is pretty good for these high-risk patients. But the patients with basal tumors had a, had a five-year overall survival of, of, 90, of 91%. It was 73 for luminal and 36 for patients with P53-like tumors. And this was, not, this was not aligned with downstaging. For instance, if you look here at downstaging, the tumors that are downstaged are in blue. The luminal tumors were, at least as many luminal tumors were downstaged as patients with basal tumors, and yet the, the survival of patients with basal tumors was superior. And a subsequent study confirmed this, this with similar results. This is data from the group from Byrne. Their classifier had four subtypes. They had a luminal subtype, they had a basal subtype, luminal infiltrate, and a, and a, and a, a clot and low subtype. And we found with patients undergoing cystectomy alone, those patients with luminal tumors had an outstanding survival. Um, when you added chemotherapy into the mix, they didn't respond to chemotherapy. Their survival is still good, but you see the survival of the basal patients with basal tumors goes way up. So there seems to be some biological reasons for that. Now, we also looked for the expression of targetable alterations. This is doing gene expression profiling. So we're looking at, uh, these are, these are these, what we found here is, if, if you see, this is a heat map. Red means high gene expression, green means, means low. In the luminal cluster, it, it's, uh, it's um, enriched for tumors that express HER2 and FGF receptor 3, two potentially targetable alterations. And we found in the uh, basal tumors, again, a high expression of EGFR and its, and its ligands. So this is an also a, a, another potentially targetable pathway in these patients, which has yet been, to, to, yet been exploited. Now, there are limitations to using molecular subtyping to predict response in neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So you use these clustering algorithms to assign patients to a specific molecular subtype. And the response to therapy is based upon their assignment to that subtype and not on their own you know, gene expression profile. So obviously, it would be preferable to, to select a patient with neoadjuvant chemotherapy using a molecular classifier 
that predicts that patient's own response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And Dan Theater Rescue's group developed the Coxin algorithm to provide a molecular classifier that predicts response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy on a case-by-case -case basis. And this, uh, this, this, uh, this was put to test on, in the uh, Coxin study. This was a SWOG study. Uh, patients with clinical T2 to T4 disease were, were enrolled, and, and they underwent a cystectomy. Tissue was collected, and they were randomized to two arms, either cis, gem cis or, or MVAC. And then they had a cystectomy, and more tissue was collected. Now, the primary endpoint wasn't to com compare the efficacy of these two arms, but rather to assess the PT0 status, you know, according to the, the Coxon score. It was powered for a 20% improvement over the historical PT0 status. So how did, how did the algorithm do? Well, unfortunately, the GC score did not predict for downstaging for GC or, or, or downstaging to PT0. The MVAC score did not res predict response to MVAC. It was only when you pooled the data did the GC score predict for downstaging. So I think the results are equivocal. And in this smaller study, we didn't find that the, the, that the subtypes actually predicted response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy either. Now, other, other investigators are, are looking at specific mutations and comparing their, the, the status of those mutations to response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. One of the first studies was looking at uh, the uh, gene uh, ERCC2, and they showed up the correlation between response to, uh, to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and, uh, and mutations in ERCC2. This was a validation study. You can see all the patients who had a, who had a, who had a mutation in ERCC2 were, survived this, this study compared to what you see in patients with, uh, with no ERCC2 mutations. And eight of 20 patients, or 40% of who had ERCC2 mutations responded, compared to two of 28, or 7% of those who did not have an ERCC2 mutation. Similar data was generated by the group at, um, at uh, uh, Fox Chase using different gene, DDR genes, ATM, RB1, and FANC. You can see this is their discovery subset using MVAC chemotherapy. Uh, this is the survival of patients who have, who, have, who have alterations versus those that don't. And this is their validation subset with GEMSYS. Again, similar findings. Now, so two groups um, recently presented this data at ASCO. They analyzed the tumors from the Coxon trial. And this is data from, uh, from um, a memorial. Where they looked at the DDR mutations in nine genes and correlated that with response to patients on the Coxon study. And what they found was that um, Mutations in, in ERCC2 correlated with uh, downstation to PT0, but if you pooled all of the mutations and all of the genes they looked at, that had a higher association with response to chemotherapy. And similar data was, was published, was presented by the group from Fox Chase using a, their own uh, four gene signature. And again, they found that downstation to PT0 correlated with ATM mutations, ERCC2 mutations, but if you looked at, pooled all the mutations and all of these DDR uh, genes, you found a better association with downstaging. I guess the question you have to answer is, are DDR gene mutations prognostic? So I went back to the uh, TCGA data. These are patients who are all underwent cystectomy, no systemic therapy, and the survival of these patients with either well tight DDR or mutated DDR are, are, are essentially the same. So where does this leave us? Well, I mean, it's complicated. Uh, the luminal subtype seems to be adequately treated by radical cystectomy alone. Uh, the basal subtype, you know, I think it's prognostic. It appeared to have, have, have the most survival benefit from neoadjuvant chemotherapy independent of staging, but I don't think it's they're inherently sensitive. I think you identify tumors that require some form of multimodal therapy. The luminal infiltrated, the P53-like subtype, or TCGA's cluster two may be resistant to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And I think the results from the Coxon trial are equivocal at best. But I think, it, I think it looks promising that alterations in DNA repair genes may identify chemosensitive tumors downstaged by neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, what about predicting response to, to you know, neoadjuvant immunotherapy? Well, there are, you know, a number of trials have been reported. You know, the complete response rate ranges from 31 to 46 percent. The higher complete response ranges are those in which they use multimodal therapy, either a combination of a PDL1 or PD1 inhibitor plus a CTLA4. The problem is that there's no correlation from one study to the next of biomarkers that protect response. For instance, in, 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 the, um, in the Abacus trial, there was no correlation between you know, uh, 
TMB, uh, PDL1, uh, high PDL1 expression, et cetera, whereas in the, in the um, peer study, they found those to be predictive. And we did a study, uh, a multimodal study, and found, found that, you know, tertiary lymph node structure density predicted response. Another group did the same study a with a different combination of drugs and found that the baseline tertiary lymph node structure didn't correlate, it was rather induction. So there's no correlation at all between myomarker expression and response to IO. And that's something that needs to be, it's, a, it's really a work in progress. So just to summarize, I think molecular subtyping, they're really not helpful for predicting downstaging a response. I think the subtypes are useful for prognosis and identifying high-risk patients such as the basal tumors who benefit from some form of multimodal therapy. I do think though the DDR mutations are useful predicting downstaging a response and the predictive biomarkers for IO are inconsistent across trials and are not ready for prime time. Now clearly, we're in the midst of a paradigm shift in the management of muscle invasive disease, moving away from the one-size-fits-all approach to manage this disease. You know, I think we're gonna to start to look at the tumor biology to guide our selection of patients for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, radical cystectomy alone, or even bladder preservation. And I think we will identify alternative therapies, such as IO, for those patients who are chemo-resistant. But really, until we get there, the pros and cons of neoadjuvant therapy should be discussed with all of our patients with muscle invasive disease undergoing radical cystectomy. Finally, I'll we'll leave you with the Texan's Guide to Life, and that is, if you're riding ahead of the herd, take a look back every now and then to make sure it's still there. Thank you. <laughs>